not just specialist stuff either. He also wrote popular books extolling the importance of maths. Here we go, there's a section on the future of mathematics. He starts, if we wish to foresee the future of mathematics, our proper course is to study the history and present the condition of the science. So I think Poincaré might well have approved of my journey to uncover the story of maths. He certainly would have approved of the next destination. Because to discover perhaps Poincaré's most important contribution to modern mathematics, I had to go looking for a bridge. Seven bridges, in fact. The seven bridges of Königsberg. Today, the city's known as Kaliningrad, a little outpost of Russia on the Baltic Sea, surrounded by Poland and Lithuania. Until 1945, however, when it was ceded to the Soviet Union, it was the great Prussian city of Königsberg. Much of the old town, sadly, has been demolished. There's now no sign at all of two of the original seven bridges, and several have changed out of all recognition. This is one of the original bridges. It may seem like an unlikely setting for the beginning of a mathematical story, but bear with me. It started as an 18th century puzzle. Is there a route around the city which crosses each of these seven bridges only once? Finding the solution is much more difficult than it looks. It was eventually solved by the great mathematician Leonard Euler, who in 1735 proved that it wasn't possible. There couldn't be a route that didn't cross at least one bridge twice. He solved the problem by making a conceptual leap. He realised you don't really care what the distances are between these bridges. What really matters is how the bridges are connected together. This is a problem of a new sort of geometry of position, a problem of topology. Many of us use topology every day. Virtually all metro maps the world over are drawn on topological principles. You don't care how far the stations are from each other, but how they're connected. There isn't a metro in Kaliningrad, but there is, in the nearest other Russian city, St. Petersburg. The topology is pretty easy on this map. It's the Russian I'm having difficulty with. Can you tell me which... Uh, what's the problem? I uh, want to know uh, what uh, station this one was. Oh, I had it the wrong way round, even. <laughs> Although topology had its origins in the bridges of Königsberg, it was in the hands of Poincaré that the subject evolved into a powerful new way of looking at shape. Some people refer to topology as bendy geometry, because in topology, two shapes are the same if you can bend or morph one into another without cutting it. So, for example, if I take a football or rugby ball, topologically they're the same because one can be morphed into the other. Similarly, a bagel and a teacup are the same because one can be morphed into the other. Even very complicated shapes can be unwrapped to become much simpler from a topological point of view. But there's no way to continuously deform a bagel to morph it into a ball. The hole in the middle makes these shapes topologically different. Poincaré knew all the possible two-dimensional topological surfaces. But in 1904, he came up with a topological problem he just couldn't solve. If you've got a flat two-dimensional universe, then Poincaré worked out all the possible shapes you could wrap that universe up into. It could be a ball, or a bagel with one hole, two holes, or more holes in. But we live in a three-dimensional universe, so what are the possible shapes that our universe could be? That question became known as the Poincaré conjecture. It was finally solved in 2002 here in St. Petersburg by a Russian mathematician called Grisha Perlman. His proof is very difficult to understand, even for mathematicians. Perlman solved the problem by linking it to a completely different area of mathematics. To understand the shapes, he looked instead at the dynamics of the way things can flow over the shape, which led to a description of all the possible ways that three-dimensional space can be wrapped up in higher dimensions. I wondered if the man himself could help in unravelling the intricacies of his proof. 
but I've been told that finding Perlman is almost as difficult as understanding the solution. The classic stereotype of a mathematician is a mad, eccentric scientist, but I think that's a little bit unfair. Most of my colleagues are perfectly normal. Well, reasonably. But when it comes to Perlman, there's no doubt he is a very strange character. He's received prizes and offers of professorships from distinguished universities in the West, but he's turned them all down. Recently, he seems to have given up mathematics completely and retreated to live as a semi-recluse in this very modest housing estate with his mum. He refuses to talk to the media, but I thought he might just talk to me as a fellow mathematician. I was wrong. Well, it's interesting. I think he's actually turned off his buzzer. Uh, probably too many media have actually been buzzing it, and I tried a neighbour. That one rang, but his doesn't ring at all. Um, in some sense, I think that it's his uh, papers, his mathematics, which speaks for itself in a way. I don't really need to meet the mathematician. And in this age of uh, big brother and big money, I think there's something rather noble about the fact that he gets his kick out of proving theorems and not winning prizes. One mathematician would certainly have applauded. For solving any of his 23 problems, David Hilbert offered no prize or reward beyond the admiration of other mathematicians. When he sketched out the problems in Paris in 1900, Hilbert himself was already a mathematical star. And it was in Göttingen in northern Germany that he really shone. He was by far the most a uh, charismatic mathematician uh, of his age. It's clear that everybody that knew him thought that he was absolutely wonderful. He studied number theory and brought everything together uh, that was there. And then within a year or so, he left that completely and uh, revolutionized the theory of integral equation. It's always change and always something new. And there's hardly anybody who is so, who is so flexible and uh, so varied in his approach that Hilbert was. His work is still talked about today, and his name has become attached to many mathematical terms. Mathematicians still use the Hilbert space, the Hilbert classification, the Hilbert inequality, and several Hilbert theorems. But it was his early work on equations that marked him out as a mathematician thinking in new ways. Hilbert showed that, that although there are infinitely many equations, there are ways to divide them up so that they are built out of just a finite set, like a set of building blocks. The most striking element of Hilbert's proof was that he couldn't actually construct this finite set. He just proved it must exist. Somebody criticised this as theology and not mathematics, but really they'd missed the point. What Hilbert was doing here was creating a new style of mathematics, a more abstract approach to the subject. You could still prove something existed, even though you couldn't construct it explicitly. It's like saying, I know there has to be a way to get from Göttingen to St. Petersburg, even though I can't tell you how to actually get there. As well as challenging mathematical orthodoxies, Hilbert was also happy to knock the formal hierarchies that existed in the university system in Germany at the time. Other professors were quite shocked to see Hilbert out bicycling and drinking with his students. He liked very much parties. Yeah? Yes. Party animal? Yes. Well, that's my kind of mathematician. <laughs> <laughs> he loved very much dancing with, with young women. He liked very much to, to flirt. Really? <laughs> Most mathematicians I know are not the biggest of flirts. Yet this lifestyle went hand in hand with an absolute commitment to maths. Hilbert was, of course, somebody who uh, thought that everybody who has a mathematical skill a penguin, a woman, a man, or black, white, or uh, yellow, it doesn't matter, he should do mathematics, right, and yeah. he should be, uh, should be admired. The mathematics but, speaks for itself, yes, in a way, that the it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter which... Uh, which Whether you're a penguin. <laughs> yes, if, if you are a penguin, it's also... Yeah. If, you, if you can prove the Riemann so, hypothesis, we really don't mind whether so you're a penguin. Mathematics were, was for him the universal language. Yeah, yeah. Hilbert believed that this language was powerful enough to unlock all the truths of mathematics, a belief he expounded in a radio interview he gave on the future of maths on the 8th of September 1930. For us there is no ignorabimus, 
In it, he had no doubt that all his 23 problems would soon be solved and that mathematics would finally be put on unshakable logical foundations. There are absolutely no unsolvable problems, he declared, a belief that's been held by mathematicians since the time of the ancient Greeks. He ended with his clarion call, we must know, we will know. Wir müssen wissen, wir werden wissen. Unfortunately for him, the very day before, in a scientific lecture that was not considered worthy of broadcast, another mathematician would shatter Hilbert's dream and put uncertainty at the heart of mathematics. The man responsible for destroying Hilbert's belief was an Austrian mathematician, Kurt Gödel. And it all started here, Vienna. Even his admirers, and there are a great many, admit that Kurt Gödel was a little odd. As a child, he was bright, sickly, and very strange. He couldn't stop asking questions, so much so that his family called him Herr Warum, Mr. Y. Gödel lived in Vienna in the 1920s and 1930s, between the fall of the Austro-Hungarian Empire and its annexation by the Nazis. It was a strange, chaotic and exciting time to be in the city. Gödel studied mathematics at Vienna University, but he spent most of his time in the cafes, the internet chat rooms.